Um, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I would have really liked to be with you, um, but yeah, sadly, because of COVID, uh, we decided it's better if I join you from Canberra, uh, which means I'm joining you today from Ngunnawal and Numbri country. And um, I'm also continuing the tradition um, of the traditional custodians of this land to look in the night sky and try to figure out how we can identify structures and substructures. Um, for example, like the Aboriginal astronomers have done with identifying substructures um, like the emu. Um, but on the other hand, thanks to the amazing data that we have from Gaia and um, now also in contribution with uh, Gala, we can really combine this data to analyze um, more detailed and complex substructures. So in addition to all the information we get from Gaia with astrometric and photometric information, um, Galadia 3 is adding more than 600,000 stars and um, especially their spectra um, to our community. And the survey is run in different, in different um, parts. We have a magnitude, limit, magnitude limited selection of the main survey, which you see here in blue, um, which really aims to, um, to understand the chemical signature of stars. We have a lot of follow-up of K2, um, of the K2 footprints. We have also observations of the Tess Hermes stars and a lot of other interesting um, observations. So the one thing um, that we do use is um, the Anglo-Australian telescope that you see here in the picture. Um, this is a four meter telescope and at the top end you see a robotic fiber positioner, which allows us to place fibers, 400 fibers at a time in a two degree field of view and then observe 400 spectra at a time. And I'm just showing you here one example spectra, which uh, are the four optical high resolution parts. Um, so on the top left, um, you see uh, the H beta line prominent in the top right, you see the H alpha line. And you see a lot of absorption features that we can use to actually get chemical abundances from. Now for this um, estimate, we use a recipe and the full recipe is uh, published um, in M and RAS, um, but just to give you an idea of how we do that, um, we have our spectrum, our 1D um, spectrum, so flux versus wavelength. And in the top right, you see uh, the observations with error bars. And what we try to do is we try to do a chi-square optimization between this observation and synthetic spectra in a two-step process. So in the first step, we estimate stellar parameters by changing the input to generate the synthetic spectra. So important stellar parameters like the temperature, surface gravity, um, and iron abundance, and so on. And once we're happy with these ones, we actually go to the individual element lines and, elevate, uh, and estimate the elemental abundances. Um, the ingredients that we use for this big recipe are almost 600,000 high resolution spectra from which we, for the stellar parameter estimation, cut out 46 segments with very high fidelity lines. So um, hydrogen lines um, and neutral and ionized scandium, titanium and iron lines. Um, and then we apply our spectrum synthesis code uh, onto them Spectrus can be uh, made easy. And that one is actually able to also um, include departures from non-LTE. So we get a much more accurate um, spectrum synthesis uh, with departures from local thermodynamic equilibrium. And in addition, we also are able, thanks to Gaia, to self-consistently estimate surface gravity, which is one of the parameters that in the spectra is typically uh, tends to be um, degenerate. But thanks to the parallax and distance information from Gaia and photometry from Tumas, and in combination all self-consistently with volumetric corrections um, from Luca Casagrande, we actually um, are able to get an idea of the luminosity and in addition with isochrone fitting of masses of the surface gravity. So thanks to Gaia, we are able to break degeneracies. And well, since we're using a recipe, I also want to give you some nutrition facts. Um, so the serving size of our data set is almost 600,000 stars. Uh, we're proud that they are quite locally produced. Um, more than 80% of these stars are within two kiloparsec. Two thirds of them are dwarfs and one third of them are typically giants. And you can see that here in this density plot where I'm just showing you the density of um, effective temperature versus surface gravity. So on the top, uh, in the bottom, you see main sequence and turn of stars. And then you see in the right, uh, top right, um, RGB stars or red giant branch stars and an overdensity of red clump stars. Um, and we have a good mix of all different kinds of galactic populations. So we have 
roughly 62% um, thin disk stars. We have 27% thick disk stars, 2% metal poor stars, and 4% stars that by kinematic criteria, so by how hot their orbits are, we can, uh, we can roughly identify them as kinematic halo stars. And we have um, 30 element abundances that we provide you with. So light elements like um, lithium, uh, carbon, oxygen, alpha process elements, light or Z elements, a lot of iron peak and even more neutron capture elements. So there's a lot of chemistry in this data set and it pairs extremely well as, uh, as Jeffrey already said with the, uh, with the great Gaia information because we have very, very precise parallax information for all of the stars that we have observed and we provide them in a value added catalogs with dynamic estimates and isochrone ages, um, which you can find on the data link down there. Now, looking at the chemical evolution, that is something um, where we have a lot of theoretical work done by a lot of amazing people, including uh, Chiaki Kobayashi, where we can try to figure out how different elements are actually synthesized. So elements like lithium, for example, are synthesized in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We have a lot of exploding stars, exploding massive stars that contribute to a lot of elements like sodium, magnesium. Exploding white dwarfs contribute a lot, for example, to manganese. Uh, we have uh, asymptotic giant branch stars contributing to a lot of different um, elements, but especially, um, for example, those like barium. And we have a combination, for example, for Euro europium, where also merge, uh, merging neutron stars are very likely playing a role. Now, this means we have a lot of different nuclear synthesis pathways, and that ultimately, uh, when we look at the chemical um, abundance distribution, will lead to very different distributions. So I'm just showing you here the absolute lithium abundance versus the iron abundance. And you see this is already very complex. Um, there's a lot of substructure because lithium is very easily destroyed. Um, and well, it's, it's a very complex element and we're gonna have a lot of talks on this element alone. So I'm looking forward to these ones. Um, we also have sodium where we provide a lot of measurements and you see here a lot of stars are clumping around zero, zero in this uh, coordinate system, which is similar to the solar value. But we also have an over density around minus one. Um, and I'm going to get back to these because they're very interesting. Uh, we also have magnesium, which looks also very different in its distribution. We have manganese, we have barium and europium. And you see all of these distributions, and I'm, I'm just plotting six out of the 30 that we have, look very different. So there's a lot of information and I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what information or what, what science you have been doing with all of these. Um, I'm personally very interested in what we can learn about accretion events in our galaxy by combining Gala DR3 with Gaia EDR3, um, because these accreted stars stick out chemically and dynamically. So if we just go back to the enhancement of alpha versus iron um, on the iron abundance plot, um, you see that depending on the interplay of um, the star formation rate and the contribution of supernovae type two and supernovae type 1a, um, we can end up with different stars in different regimes in, of, this, uh, of this diagram. So typically very old stars will have higher alpha. Um, and as time continues, we will at some point have contributions from supernova type 1a, which will uh, increase the iron abundance, um, but lower the alpha to iron ratio. So we have a typical knee, and this is where the high alpha disk, and at the end around zero, zero, the low alpha disk or thin disk is typically. But you see this interesting um, regime of metal poor and low alpha stars, and this is where we as, uh, expect the accreted halo to be like. And indeed, this is where we see stars when we um, plot in the background the Galadia 3 data. So this is the chemistry, but also dynamically these stars stick out. And typically this has been done with, uh, with a tumor diagram. So you plot the um, as a movable velocity versus the other two um, velocity components um, with respect to the sun and the local standard of rest. So zero, zero are stars that move like the thin disk. And as orbits are hotter and hotter, you see that these stars tend to go further away from zero and typically um, are going, especially for the accreted halo stars, to very negative um, as a move of velocities with respect to the local standard of rest, which means almost no uh, prograde rotation. Um, and this is really interesting because um, this is especially the regime where Nissen and Schuster have done pioneering work by looking at these stars on very um, on, on, uh, on orbits with very high total velocity. And then they have been able uh, with high resolution spectroscopy to identify in these, in these uh, kinematic halo stars, um, two different sequences, the low alpha halo and the high alpha halo. 
and especially for the no uh, for the low alpha halo they found no uh, prograde rotation so typically angular momenta around zero um, we've had a lot of uh, work thanks to Gaia where for example Vasily Belokurov has, uh, has also been able to to look at the galactocentric uh, velocities and found um, the substructure around uh, with the theta of, uh, of zero which he called the sausage and there's a lot of work going on and I'm, I'm very happy that we will have a lot of people talking about their work as well um, looking not only at the chemodynamic uh, selection, but also the dynamical one. Um, Amina Helmi has done a lot of amazing work looking at the orbits. So combining the energies of uh, the orbit energies of stars and actions to identify a lot of substructure, including um, similar to the sausage, the Gaia and Celados. And Diane Foyer, who will also speak later, has done amazing work on trying to characterize um, the actions of this Gaia sausage, Gaia sausage and Celados. Um, and there's a lot of other amazing work in the field. But the one that I want to focus on is actually how we can select accreted stars chemically. And this is where Paul Das and Keith Hawkins and Paula Hofle have done amazing work, um, trying to look at how we can combine element abundances like magnesium, aluminum, manganese, which are produced by supernovae type two and 1A. And they have been able to identify accreted stars in the top left of this um, diagram, um, and been able to, uh, to do a purely chemical selection. And there's also other work that I, that I want to mention here. But looking at Galadia 3, how can we select stars chemically in Galadia 3? And how does this chemical selection compare to the dynamical selections, for example, of the Gaia sausage and Salados? So for my work um, that I'm presenting, I'm starting again from the Nissen and Schuster analysis. So I've basically, uh, in the tumor diagram, identified stars um, with, uh, with high total velocities and then did a cut to identify the low alpha halo stars. And what I'm interested in is trying to figure out the significance of separation. So how different are the low alpha halo and the high alpha halo in different element abundances? So you can calculate that basically by taking the, the difference of the mean distribution, um, mu one and mu two, and just divide that by uh, the standard deviation of the distributions. So looking at the data, I'm going to show the Nissen and Schuster low alpha in red, high alpha in blue, and Gala in orange. And what you see here is where I'm just plotting the manganese over iron versus sodium over iron. Um, you have the, the typical disk stars in black in the, in the background, and you have the low alpha stars in red and orange here, and they're quite different from the high alpha um, halo stars. So looking at the R values, we see that these R values are quite high. Um, basically, a value of two means very significant uh, separation. If we look at sodium, we see a value of 1.3, also very high. Um, you can also look at manganese, and you see that uh, similar to a lot of other iron uh, peak elements, these values are a bit lower, but still significant. Um, and looking at yttrium or other nutrient capture elements, for these ones, the separation is, is lower because either of intrinsic scatter or because of our measurement uncertainties. So which ones should we now use to select accreted stars chemically? And we have to do a compromise here between the separation significance and the detection rate. Because as we go towards lower and lower iron abundances, we can detect uh, absorption features less and less well. So looking at the detection rate here as a function of the iron abundance um, for elements like magnesium and manganese, we're doing pretty OK. But aluminium, for example, we're not doing well below iron abundances of minus one. So looking at the separation significance and detection rate, I basically believe that the best unique elements for iron abundances of minus 0.5 for Gala are magnesium, sodium, and manganese. And now we can, uh, similar to the work of Das and others, apply Gaussian mixture models to, uh, to a similar abundance plane. And we can apply Gaussian mixture models to basically uh, model how many Gaussian components do we need to fit the observed data. And then uh, do an MC or a Monte Carlo sampling of uncertainties. Um, or we can also do an extreme convolution where we are able to include the uncertainties both in the fitting and in the predicting of which star actually belongs to which component. Um, and I've done a lot of different tests, tested different combinations and also try to figure out how many components do we need with the Bayesian uh, information criterion. And we typically need six to five components to fit the right hand uh, plot that I'm showing here. And the orange um, stars are the ones that are actually part of the, uh, of the accreted signature in chemical space. Um, 
So this is our chemical selection. Now, what I want to do is I want to compare this with a dynamical selection. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, selections available, but I'm concentrating here on the one of the Gaia sausage enchiladas that uh, Diane has provided in her, in her latest paper, where we can do a selection in angular momentum and radial action space. So you see this red, uh, this red box here, and ex exactly these both uh, coordinates. And what we are interested in is how do the orange and red uh, points actually um, compare? And if we look at um, the, uh, the overlap of both uh, in the top, we can see in, uh, in purple, the overlap is much more, uh, is much more uh, denser or much narrower. Um, and we also see that the dynamical selection- I mean, uh, it's been. Yeah. The dynamical selection also includes um, stars with higher sodium than what we would have uh, initially identified based on chemistry. And then the actual really, really interesting part is the, is the bottom left, where I'm showing you the angular momentum and radial action. Um, and you see that the clean selection box dynamically is the red box, um, but our chemically selected stars are going far outside of this box. Um, so what does this mean? Looking at the properties here, um, the first thing we can compare is actually the iron abundances. Um, because there has been already a lot of studies going on of the iron abundance distribution. And our study with Galadia 3, no matter if we select stars um, chemically or dynamically, and especially if we focus on the Gaia sausage enceladus, they always have very similar uh, iron abundances around minus 1.1, minus 1.2. Um, and that's very similar to what Diane has found both with SkyMapper data and with Apogee data. Um, now, if we go back to the action space, um, we see that our data, first of all, um, extends um, outside of this dynamical box. Only 28% of our chemical selection are within the clean dynamical selection box um, because our angular, uh, our radial actions extend far below um, square root or 900 um, kpc um, per KMS radial action. Um, looking again at the chemical, um, overview, we see that a lot of these sodium stars of the dynamical selection actually have higher um, sodium uh, abundances. So one of the questions that I'm asking myself, and this is still ongoing work, is how reliable is our chemical selection actually? Because what we're doing is we're finding over densities in sodium iron versus magnesium manganese. And these could include all kinds of accreted substructures, not only the Gaia sausage and salados, um, we also have to still do work on how complete is our selection. So this is really work that will be long-term work to understand the underlying structure of what we actually see here. How dominant is the Gaia sausage enceladus within the accreted structures? Um, and I think one of, the, one of the potential keys here will be to, to look at stars that are actually not overlapping when you select them chemically or dynamically. So looking at stars with the same abundances but different orbits, and looking at stars with the same orbits but different abundances. Because um, once we figure out how much contamination we actually have, we can try to estimate how much mixing happened between the stars that have been accreted and the in situ Milky Way stars. And also try to get an estimate of how long, how long did the accretion event actually go? Not only when did it occur, but how long did it go? Um, so to summarize my talk, first of all, Galadia 3 is available. Um, it has been a lot of work that all of us have put in. Uh, I'm very happy that it's finally out there. So please um, either look at the archive um, to find the recipe, as I call it, um, or look on, uh, on our new website. Um, but coming to my work, um, I looked at the most uh, significant chemical difference between, first of all, low, uh, low alpha and high alpha halo. I found several elements that work uh, that show significant differences, but also including the detection rate for metal poor stars um, I find the highest um, detection rate and chemical differences for magnesium, manganese, and sodium for Gala. And then once we apply Gaussian mixture models to model this combination, um, we actually do find these, um, these stars uh, to be in the top left of this uh, sodium iron versus magnesium manganese um, plot. Um, but we find a difference between the chemical and dynamical selection, especially when it comes to the sodium abundance. But looking at the, chemi uh, looking at the dynamical information, what we saw was that especially the chemical selection extends much below um, what we would find in the clean dynamical selection box. So only 28% of our chemical selection are within the clean dynamical selection box. And the next steps that will be uh, 
important is to understand the overlap, the differences and the underlying structure. And I'm not showing it yet, um, but we, we already have stellar age estimates and we're gonna add these to the picture. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sven, that was great. Now for questions, if you can go ahead and raise your hand on the Zoom, um, then we'll go through uh, questions that way. Uh, so do we have questions for Sven? All right, um, Paula. Hey, I, I don't see myself. Hi, Sven. Hi, uh, Really cool talk. Very exciting results. Uh, very exciting to see the uh, sodium uh, plot. It looks very similar to aluminum, but it's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you want to plan to determine ages in your case? I mean, for yeah, this kind so, of stars. Yeah, so for the ages, um, a lot of the stars that we have in Gala for, for the accreted stars are going to be red giant branch stars. Uh, which is very tricky uh, with Gala because we don't measure nitrogen. So uh, we don't really get uh, information from the carbon nitrogen ratio, for example. But um, there is hope um, from a very limited number of main sequence turnoff stars. Um, and this is where we believe that we can um, get much better information from isochrone fitting. Um, so yeah, so so far uh, with the purely chemical selection, we have 14 main sequence turnoff stars with our chemical selection, uh, which is not a lot, but we have 120 uh, in the dynamical selection. So there is hope. Um, and I can actually, um, I hope I'm allowed to share again, uh, just show you what happens if you look at main sequence turnoff stars only instead of looking also at the red giant branch stars, because there the isochrone ages are rather un, untrustworthy, I would say. Um, so on the left-hand side, I'm showing you our chemical selection. Um, and on the right-hand side, you have the dynamical selection. And this is, um, if you look at these, uh, at these numbers, uh, we find these stars always to be very old if you look at the main sequence turnoff stars. Um, and actually in agreement with uh, what you and, and Paul and uh, also Diane have found in, in your works. If that answers the question. Cool, thanks. Uh, other questions for Sven? Yes. Uh, yeah, you want to come up here? I think it's easier. I think in the future we can have, have type them in the chat for the in person. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, no, so I was going to ask. Um, since you mentioned that the abundance pattern you're looking for is maybe similar for multiple accretion events, do we have uh, chemical evolution models for dwarf galaxies that can predict how they might be different depending on their properties? Um, that is a question I would have to give, give back to the room. I, um, I would believe so, I hope so, um, but I, I haven't looked for them yet, but it would be amazing. I'm not sure uh, if somebody as input. I'm not sure if people like Chiaki are online um, or others. Um, I, I have to say, I don't know, but yeah, that would be really good to have. Okay, thanks. All right, um, one last question um, from uh, Farnik. Hi, thank you so much for Hi. a great talk. Um, I, would just, I would just a quick question. Uh, in your Gaussian mixture model, uh, you use two-dimensional space, right? Just two elements in your model. So um, I was wondering, you know, I mean, um, what stops you of adding more uh, chemical abundances in your model or why don't you add different, I mean, chemical abundances to, to, for, for, for your uh, Gaussian mixture model, actually? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um... I'm gonna go back to one of these slides that I showed. Um, so ideally, I really would like to uh, include many more um, abundances, but the problem is ultimately what comes down to this plot, the detection rate. Um, so if you want to include, for example, aluminum, which was one of the telltale elements that Apogee can measure well, um, we're limited by the detectability of the absorption lines. Um, so ultimately, yeah, I have tried um, a lot of different combinations of all of these elements um, and some work better, um, some work not so good. Um, 
I also have tried instead of, for example, putting in sodium over iron or magnesium over iron to put in magnesium over hydrogen because that and adds a different, uh, a different structure. And uh, Diane has, has written a nice paper about why magnesium hydrogen might work actually better. Um, but yeah, um, I have to admit, I'm also just at, at the beginning of understanding this substructure and how adding one more element can give you either the same or a very different result. Um, and I've, I yeah, I've seen in your paper, you've also explored that with Gaussian mixture models. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much, yeah. Let's see.